full, I always forget how awesome you guys sound singing. And in the first service, it's, I think it's our, our lowest attended, and so it's you know, a little quieter. But wow, this place, packed with us singing those songs. Is, that was cool. I'm usually upstairs doing, doing Sunday school for students, so I don't get to be down here and hearing, hearing you guys. My name is TJ Calloway. If you don't know me, I, am the, the, I get to be the student pastor here at the church. And if you've been sitting here in our, our, our service for, since January, we've been going through a, a series that Pastor Steve has called Righteous versus Religious. And I've been going through the same series on Wednesday night. It just happened to be a coincidence. And I call it SOM, the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we've been going through. And I call it upstream. So, so Christians, we're supposed to go upstream against the crowd. And non-Christians, or religious, as Steve calls it, that's going downstream. That's easy. And one of the great things I like about getting to speak here on Sunday morning is, is I don't get to speak very often. It's maybe once every six months. And so when I get to speak, it's sort of like a... <clears throat> maybe like a mile marker for me, time-wise. So the last time I spoke was six months ago. And for me, it feels like that was just yesterday. But that was six months ago. And, it's, it, it, and I think, wow, the last time I spoke, I'd only been here a year and a half, and then, and then before that, I'd only been here a year. And whew, Wow, time flies. So I've been here now uh, in Panama for almost two years, which is crazy to think how fast that goes. I, I feel like I just moved here. And I, and I sort of pride myself, or I'm very proud of the fact that my father is Guatemalan. You've heard me say that. I consider myself half Guatemalan, but, but I definitely am still from the U.S. I have the North American culture. And, and, and because of that, I, I sort of feel like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm getting very comfortable in Panama. And, and the Panama culture is, is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm acing that test daily. And then every once in a while, God just likes to throw sort of a curveball and, and remind me that I, I'm not quite yet comfortable. I'll give you an example. If you haven't heard the news, Amber and I are, are both pregnant. And uh, some of you already know where I'm maybe going. Here, here's, here's where the culture, the curveball comes in. Amber tells people, hey, I'm pregnant. And I can't count. I've lost track of how many people immediately just go and touch her stomach. And the first couple of times, it was, hey, what are you doing? Just get your hand. And now, Amber's kind of a trooper. She's so used to people touching her stomach, she now is, oh, I'm pregnant. And she just sort of flaunts it. <laughs> Touch. Take part. <laughs> so we're getting used to it. Curveball, you know, that test we, we've passed. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, would you, would you mind opening them to Matthew? And they should just, they should just, just open right up to it. For three and a half months, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. And we're in Matthew chapter number 6. So if you would, take your Bibles. Go to Matthew chapter number 6. For the last three and a half months, we've been going through Matthew chapter 5. It's the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is talking to a, a crowd of people. And he, and he uses the same phrase over and over, regardless of the subject. And, and, and the subject has been, okay, you've heard it said, or, or you've seen it done this way, and that's religious. But I tell you, or, or I want you to do this, and, and this is righteous. That's the way we're supposed to do it. And Pastor Steve has had, week by week, he's had a, a table up here with, of two bowls. And if you remember, one is, they're both clean on the outside, but one's dirty on the inside, and he, and he holds it up. And I thought about using it this week, and, you know, let me show you, but I, I looked at it last week, and the dirty one is just disgusting. And I just don't have, I'm, I'm kind of a clean freak, and I just, I just couldn't take the nerve to touch it. Because <laughs> he just leaves it in his office, and, it, and I can't sleep at night knowing that that's in the office next to me, and it's going it's to wake up. And <laughs> but you get the idea, and that's what we've been going through, re religious versus righteous. And then we move to, to Matthew chapter 6, and it's the same, it's the same theme. 
Jesus says, okay, this is what you've seen. That's religious. Well, now let me tell you what you're supposed to do, and that's, that's righteous. And there's three topics all in a row that he talks about. Last week was giving. Today is, is prayer. And next week is fasting. And he says, look at it, verse, verse, verse number one. We've we got to stay in context. I'm talking about prayer this morning, but our context is very important. So chapter number six of Matthew, verse number one. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then he gives three examples. Last week was when you give, when you pray, that's today, and next week is when you fast. I'm going to read verse 1 again. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then we're going to talk about prayer. Would you join me in prayer as we get into what God's going to teach us us this morning? Pray with me if you would. Father, we are so blessed and so grateful to have a sanctuary like our own, filled with worshipers singing praise to you. Thank you, Lord, for our team who has led us this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that we have that ability to just sing out to you with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, as we move to the second part of our worship service, I pray, Lord, as we now look at your word, just a, just a, a tiny part of it, as, as Pastor Steve always says, I, I pray, Lord, that it would just be a magnifying glass in our lives. It, it would reveal areas in us that we need to give over to you. I pray, Lord, that you would speak in the way that only you can, which is very personal and very intimate to every single person here. Lord, you speak. I have nothing to say and I have nothing to offer. Make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I need to tell you a little bit about myself before we talk about prayer. My spiritual gift is not prayer. You've heard of spiritual gifts, and and, and you know there's a list of spiritual gifts. One of them is prayer, and that's not one of mine. I am one of those people, and and you can judge me or pray for me, but whenever whenever I hear about a a prayer meeting or or a prayer night, I'm kind of the last person to go. And and if I do go, I kind of go out of guilt, or I go because... Amber's making me go because she, she and that's one of her spiritual gifts is prayer. So prayer isn't, isn't, isn't my bent. And I would assume that, that a lot of you or, or many of you would, would maybe be in that same camp. You would say that I've got a lot of spiritual gifts, but, but prayer's not one of them. And not to make you feel guilty, but, but whenever we have a, a church service or, or retreat, I mean, we're packed, Right? But then when we have a prayer night or, or a, a, prayer mo- a prayer moment in our church, you know, turnout is, is tiny. Most people don't go. And I'm not, I don't say that to make you feel guilty, but, but, but I say that because I, I'm, I'm in that same camp. Prayer isn't, isn't my natural bent. It's not something that just pours out of, out of my heart. But as Pastor Steve shared this morning and, and gave us a spotlight on one of our ministries here at Crossroads, we have a very strong and dynamic prayer team. So on the other end of, of the sphere, there, there's people who, who prayer is, is so natural for you. It is, it is just an outflow of who you are. When you hear prayer night, you're the first person to sign up. When somebody has a need or, or a concern or a heartache, somebody like me, my first response isn't let me pray for you, but, but you might have that be your first response. Let me pray for you. Man, let me just take this to the king. And we have two, we have two camps. And, and sometimes, sometimes either camp kind of judges the other side. For example, when I first started out in student ministry, the first church I worked at, I had to wear a suit every Sunday morning. It was one of the requirements. So I wore a suit every Sunday morning. And it's not my personality. And I quickly learned that when I would go to the next church, one of the, the pillars of who I am, I would always ask, what's the attire? Do I have to wear a suit on Sunday morning? 
And when I came to this church, I'd love to tell you that, that, that when I came to Panama in January of, of almost three, three years ago, and, 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 I, and I just felt the Spirit, and I could just feel the calling, and I just knew that this was the place I was supposed to be, I would love to tell you that, but I would be lying. The, the reality is, I saw our children's pastor wearing shorts, and I knew, that's where I need to be. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> We're not going to pay you. I don't care. I get to wear shorts every day. And, and so I, I kind of like that. And, there's, and there's, there's certain personalities that are very formal. You know, you wear a suit. When you view God or when you pray, it's a very, it's a very formal and it's a very high privilege that you, that you have. And, and, and maybe that, 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 that's your side. Maybe you're like me and you're on the other side where your prayer is very casual and it's very laid back and you're sort of shorts and t-shirt kind of prayer. Versus, versus a suit. And what I love about this passage that we're going to get into, Jesus just kind of cuts right through the middle of our different personalities because we're very, very different. I, I, I should not, nor, nor will I, ever tell you how you should pray because the way I pray, my personality is very, very different from yours. And, and you, by the same token, shouldn't tell me how you pray or what works for you because what works for you might not work for me. And Jesus, in this passage, is going to cut right, right through the middle. And he's going to speak to both of us, no matter where you are, on, on the sphere of the topic of prayer. And to be just very, very honest with you, the topic of prayer is probably the last topic I should be talking about. <laughs> because it's not a spiritual gift of mine. But let's see what Jesus says, okay? Let's look at it. Here's my Bible. Matthew 6. Let's look at verse number 5. So remember, be careful. Don't practice your righteousness in front of others. That's what Jesus says. It's the context. So verse 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. That's the definition of religious. Somebody who prays and it's all a show. When you pray, you're praying so that other people will see you. Okay? Verse 6. This is a righteous prayer. This is going upstream against the crowd. Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's righteous praying. Religious praying is praying, as Jesus says, on a street corner so that everybody sees you. It's a show. It's external. But Jesus says if you want to really pray, you want to have a religious prayer, you go to your room and you shut the door and you get alone with God. And if you remember last week when, 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 when Pastor Steve talked about the giving and how some of us give in, in a showmanship way, the context of last week's passage was what the Pharisees would do. They would, you can look, if you remember it, they would, they would blow a trumpet before they'd go. And they'd have, they'd have this big, this, as, they'd have this big, um, like, crate of money. And they would break it down into, like, pennies. So they would announce that they're coming. And they'd come with their big, like, all this money. And they would pour it into the offering bucket. And it would just pour and pour and pour. And, and they would get, you know, everybody would watch and go, wow, this, I mean, this guy is giving a lot of money. I mean, that's amazing. Give God be the glory. And, and Pastor Steve gave like a, a today example of how maybe we do that. And, and, and one way is, you know, if you remember, we, you know, we publicly, hey, where's the offering plate? Do, who do I make the check out to? And, and do I, you know, and we make a big show. So we get to this passage of, of, of prayer. And, and Jesus says, don't, don't be on the street corner and, and, and just be a show for other people. And I thought about, wh what does that look like today? What does it look like for, for people who pray religiously? It's a religion, it's a show, it's external. How does that look today? And I gave the assignment after the first service. I said, here's my two examples. If you think of one better, come and tell me. And nobody did. So, so maybe these two examples are really good. I'm still not convinced. So if you have a, a better example than the two I'm going to give, please tell me. And we'll, I'll make this better, and the third service will benefit from my awesome talk. 
Here's what I thought of. I, I thought of about, and I do this, and I do this, and maybe some of you do this too, but, but I'm going to keep it on me. I, I do this. I, I might have an amazing devotional time. And I just spent that morning or, or yesterday, you know, 30 minutes alone, which is a record. And I just, and I was in God's Word and I was alone with Him. And I will find, I'm, I'm very good at it, I will find a time when I'm talking with somebody later that day when I can just sort of slip, slip that in. And somebody will ask, well, you know, how was your day? Oh, it was great. You know, I, I, you know, I don't want to share this, but, you know, I just, this morning when I was alone with the Lord for 30 minutes in my, in my personal quiet time, and then I tell the story, but, but I'm, I'm sharing that, so, wow, man, TJ, way to go, way to go. And I'm doing it for a show. I'm, I'm sharing that with you so I, I, get the, I get the applause. I thought of another example, and this maybe is not a good one, but no one corrected me. And I'm not throwing rocks, and I'm not, I'm not thinking of anybody in mind, but I, I think of this for forever, forever. You, you, you go out to lunch with a, with a group of coworkers or with people you know in your office or your family, and, and you're out to lunch, and you're with everybody, and it's, and it's maybe not appropriate as you're eating lunch to, as a group to pray. So what you do, or what some people will do, they are all sitting there, and you will just sort of, <clears throat> your plate's there, and you'll just sort of... Amen. And then you'll eat. And everybody at the table's, well, that was weird. <laughs> and, and maybe, and I'm not saying when you do that or when I do that, you know, we're doing it for a show, but, but maybe that's an example of when we pray to, to put on a show so people will see us. And, and, and the question would be, well, why can't you in that situation, to put this principle into effect, why couldn't you just keep your eyes open and, and let nobody know that you're praying before you eat your lunch? You just sort of get your plate and your food, and, and nobody would know, and you'd get no reward except your father would see it, right? Don't mean to convict anybody. I mean that's just, it's, just, it's what I struggle with, and, and maybe I'm the only one. So let's look at this. Let's look at. Let's keep going with, with this prayer. So he says in verse six, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. That is a righteous prayer. When you pray, Jesus says. You close the door, and, you, and you're alone with him. It's not public. It's not for a show. But when you pray, this is Jesus, you go to your room, and you close the door. And the natural question that I ask, and maybe you're asking too, is why would Jesus say that? When he teaches you and I how to pray, and he gives us the example of a religious prayer, he says you're public. But if you're going to have a righteous prayer... You go to your room and you shut the door and you be alone. One tr some translations say you go to your inner closet. Not just in your room, but you go even, even more inner of your room, your private, private closet. So you've got two doors shut and nobody knows you're there. I wonder why Jesus would, would say that. Because it's kind of opposite of what I've always told people and, and what I've always talked about and maybe what we've always read. We always kind of focus on, on, on kind of a formula. We always kind of for, focus on, on public prayer. But, but Jesus says if you really want to pray, you, you get alone with him and you shut your door. It's a good question and he's going to answer it in just a minute. Let's keep looking. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Time out. It's another good question. Verse, verse 8, Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. God knows what you need before you ask Him. So the next question I would ask is, well then why am I supposed to pray? I mean, he already knows what I'm going to ask him. I'm just, I'm just a record player. He already knows. Why, why, why do I pray? The two questions. Why, why does Jesus say we go into our closet and we shut the door? It's alone. And the second question is just a very honest question. Why am I supposed to pray? If he knows everything, why do I pray? Now let's look at the Lord's Prayer. Quick comment before we look at it. Almost all theologians and almost anything you read on the Lord's Prayer, commentary-wise, most people are in agreement that the Lord's Prayer is just a model. It's not meant to just be quoted and, and, and have no meaning. It's just an example, okay? That's really, really important to know that we have that context. This is just an example. 
But he gives it. So then, this then is how you should pray. Verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And the prayer ends. We add, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power. That's not a part of the original prayer. We, we have added that later on. So the two questions. Why does Jesus tell us effective prayers are done when we close the door? That's the first question. And the second question is, well then why do I pray? First question. Why does Jesus say you want to really pray? You go to your closet, your inner closet, and you shut the door. It's a great question. And Jesus answers it with the second word of his prayer. Father. He could have directed in this model, he could have used any word. He could have said, Master. Because that's who God is. He's, he's my master. He's your master. He could have said, our king, because that's who he is. He's our king. He could have said, our Lord. He is. He's my Lord and he's your Lord. God. He, absolutely, God. He, he could have used that. He is God. But he chose to use the word Father. And the real word that Jesus is using is not Father, like this kind of big word, but he uses the word Abba, which means Daddy. Not just Father, not just Dad, but Daddy. That's who the prayer is directed towards. Daddy. I've been reading two books recently. I read one about a year ago before I knew I was going to talk about, about prayer, and I brought it. I don't usually have hard copies because I, I, I'm young and I hate paper. I do, I, I'm an electronic guy, but I, I have a hard copy so I can lend to people if they ever ask. Don't ask today because I got a third service. But here's a, here's a book that I have. It's called Approaching God, and it's written by Steve Brown, and it's one of the best books on prayer I have ever read. And I thought I would bring it just so you can see it. It's called Approaching God by Steve Brown, and why I like this book, <laughs> why I love this book, is there's no guilt involved. He makes it really clear or, or, or uses the point that prayer is not something that we guilt people into doing. You know, if, if you don't have long-winded prayers, you don't need to feel guilty. And he also makes a point that, that people kind of go through seasons, and I definitely believe that. If you're somebody where you don't have the spiritual gift of prayer, you might go through seasons of, of, of times in your life where you don't need long, long, intimate moments with, with God. And that's okay. But if you're somebody who is just desiring just to go deeper, 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 and just the very drop of God's word and the very drop of God's uh, tongue on your life, it just, you need that. And you're in that moment. This is what this book is about, and I love it. And one of the greatest things, the greatest thing I love about this book is the focus is on Daddy. Who the prayer is directed towards. Not just Master, not just Lord, not just King, but to Dad. Why is that? Because it is so, 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 so intimate. How much Dad loves you and loves me. And the way I pray in my closet alone, I cannot pray that same way publicly this morning. If the way I pray when I'm alone with Dad and I'm just in that moment where no matter what I say, He will forever love me and I don't even understand that concept. And I'm alone with the King, with my Dad in the closet and what I say to Him, I could never say publicly in my prayers this morning because if I did, you would kick me out of this sanctuary. Because I'm just, I'm just open. And I just say, Dad, you, you need to heal me. I'm here for you. And it's just very, very intimate. This book, Approaching God, quotes a famous theologian that says, for me to describe my prayer life would be the same as describing the intimacy with my wife. If you get that, you get what it means to pray to Daddy. It's so intimate. It is so secret. It is so alone. Nobody can understand because he's there for you and he loves you. 
And maybe you're somebody, and I thought about this, I thought about somebody who hears the word dad and, and, and your hair just kind of crawls up on your neck because you had a bad example. I would point you to Matthew 7, the very next chapter, where, where Jesus says, let me, let me show you what your father is like. Your father, your dad, is somebody who loves you so much he just wants to give you gifts. He just wants to give you gifts. So whatever, whatever picture you have of your own dad, if it was a bad example, you just get that out of your mind. Because that's not who God the Father is. The God the Father that I worship and I pray to loves you and loves me so much, it is ridiculous. The fact that you can say whatever you want to him and he won't look away. He won't shame you. He won't make you feel guilty. He will love you no matter what. That is, that's mind-blowing. I, I can't even wrap my head around that. Dad, you can pray to him. I can pray to him. Let's keep looking. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't think this needs to be explained too much, but who's sovereign in heaven? God is. Whose way in heaven, when God says this happens, it happens. Nobody argues. For some reason, God has given us a gift of, of just a little tiny bit of time, and that's us living on earth, and this little bit of time, he allows us to argue back and to kind of do our own thing. It's just a very small speck of time. And when you pray to God, you say, God, you are so sovereign in your kingdom. I want that same sovereignty in my kingdom. What goes, goes in heaven, and I want that to happen in my life. You be sovereign in my life, and I will just submit to you. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. I don't know if you're like me, but that verse doesn't really, doesn't really resonate. I, I don't feel like I need to pray daily for God to give me bread. Especially if you're like me, and I, and I think we're all kind of the same. We have you know, pantries full of food. I, I don't go hungry. I mean, we go grocery shopping, and I buy everything. You know, in fact, I'm, I'm forbidden most of the time to go with Amber to the grocery store because we will buy twice as many things. Oh, we need that, we need that. Oh, yeah, we need that. You know, and, we just, and she gets angry. My gosh, you just doubled our bill. And I'm, man, I'm sorry. So, so this daily bread thing doesn't really resonate with me because I, 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 don't, I don't really need that. In fact, I am so beyond my pantry. In my pantry, I've got food in case there's an emergency. I've got cans of food, and, and maybe this makes me weird, but until there's an emergency, you're going to come knocking on my door. I've got cans of food in my pantry that don't need electricity, don't need gas. I can just open them and we can eat them if something were to happen. And we've got gallons of water, and basically Amber and I have calculated we've got like four or five days of just, we're okay. If something were to happen, and, and, I, and I hate saying that because I've got neighbors that live up the hill next to me, and I know one of these days an emergency is going to happen, and Steve and Heather are going to come knocking on my door, and I'm going to say, Amber, lock the door! <laughs> We're guarding our food. They're going to take it there, you know? So th th this daily bread thing, it just doesn't, it just doesn't resonate with me, but then, I, but then I thought of an example. As I just sort of pondered it, and as I chewed on this, this verse, give us our daily bread, I thought of a quote I heard a long time ago, and I, and I have yet to forget it. The quote was, As human beings, we are 24 hours away from anarchy. As human beings, we are 24 hours away from anarchy. And I thought about, no, Really? And I try to think of an event, in a modern event, where maybe that happened. After 24 hours, just everything just broke loose. And I thought about the event, 2005, if you remember, Hurricane Katrina. I remember that event because it happened over my birthday, and it was a real sore spot. You know, here's my birthday, and oh, boy, I've got to watch this. And I, I won't forget it, but I, I thought about, let me just look up some dates and just kind of see maybe what, what happened. Now that it's been, you know, seven, eight, nine years, what, what's happened, you know, looking back? Let me, let me show you what I found. I'm just going to read a couple of things. I found several different articles about it that kind of put it into a timeline, and I thought I would just, just kind of read, read for you the timeline. It's very short, but these are different sources, and I've put it all together in one very short article. 
Hurricane Katrina, if you remember, hit August 28th, right before midnight. And it hit the city of New Orleans. Remember? August 28th, just before midnight. So you've got all day of August 29, post-hurricane. By August 30, 24 hours later, looting had spread throughout the city, often in broad daylight and in the presence of police. One of the, the government people is quoted by saying, the looting is out of control. We're using exhausted, scarce police to control looting when they should be used for search and rescue while we still have people on rooftops. End of quote. Sniper fire was reported throughout the city, and it was targeted at rescue helicopters, relief workers, and police officers. One of the reasons was there was resistance to being helped. 24 hours later. Several news sources reported instances of fighting, drug use, theft, rape, murder in the Superdome and other refugee centers. If you remember, the Superdome is a giant stadium there in downtown New Orleans. And they had put thousands of people in there who either could not or refused to leave the city before the hurricane happened. And there was all these refuge, refuge centers, and this is what happened in it. There were 25,000 people under that one roof, the Superdome. There was no running water, no electricity, and there was zero information. Six people died on one day. Four of them were natural. One was drug overdose, and one was suicide. In the aftermath, a tourist went up to a police officer and asked for help, and the cop said to him, it's every man for themselves. That's August 30, one day. August 31, 48 hours after. New Orleans' 1,500-member police force was ordered to abandon search and rescue missions and turn their attention toward controlling the widespread looting. 1,500 people who were there to help had to stop helping people and to, ca to contain the situation. The mayor said, we are in desperate SOS following his city's inability to control looting. The governor ordered that all of New Orleans, including the Superdome, be evacuated. That's 48 hours. 24 hours later, total anarchy. 48 hours later, it is so bad, people have to just be kicked out. You've got to just leave. Does that change give us our daily bread a little bit? It is, it is absolutely by God's grace that you and I have a pantry full of food. It, it is absolutely by, by God's grace that we have running water today and we have electricity. But man, that stops for just a minute. If the electricity went out right now, I have to stop. Service is over because we get hot or I get hot. And there's no electricity. You can't hear me. Okay, see you guys later. I mean, we're just 24 hours away from, from total, total anarchy. I made up a quote, I don't know if it's true, but it feels like it's true, that basically grocery stores you know, only have about a day's worth. And you cut off the, their, their restocking that comes empty. You've seen it happen. If you've ever lived in a place where there's hurricanes and there's, I mean, everything just goes and there's, everything's gone. It's by grace that we have a ton of bread today. And the reason, the, the focus isn't so much on the bread, but it's a realization that God's hand is just holding back the paper-thin veil of life that you and I have. Because life is just paper, paper, thin. And only one thing could happen, and total anarchy happens. Give us today our daily bread. Whether you realize it or not, you are in desperate need of God's provision, His help, His guidance, His love, His mercy, His grace. We need it. And it only takes one event to change that quickly. 
quickly, let's, look, let's keep going in the Lord's Prayer. Verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So, God, forgive me of my sins. And then the part I don't really like, the same way as I have forgiven others. So, God, forgive me of my sins, and that should be the same way that I have forgiven others who have sinned against me. That verse makes me uncomfortable. I mean, I like to say, God, forgive me of my sins. That, that one's easy, but, but also forgive me the way that I have forgiven those who have sinned against me. Let's just skip that one. It makes me too uncomfortable. Verse 13. Verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a poor translation in English. God does not lead you ever into temptation. A better way to say that would be, God, help me not to succumb to temptation. The, the idea is, God will never lead you or lead me into temptation, ever. The idea of this is, God, I want to sin big. And I am an expert sinner. I am so good at being religious. I am so good at being phony. God, please help me not to make a mistake today. Because I will do it big if you let me. Help me, God. And that's the model prayer. And then it ends. Verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I was kind of hoping to avoid the verse before that. The 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's secret number two to prayer. Number one, you close your door. Number two, you fix broken relationships. You fix broken relationships. Effective prayers, you close your door and you fix broken relationships. Because how can you and I expect to have this close oneness with God and yet hate our neighbor or your neighbor hate you and you can't even talk to your neighbor? I can't tell you how many times I've heard or I have said the phrase of, man, I, you know, I just can't stand that person. They did this against me. They did this against me. And you know, it's funny as I feel really distant from God. I don't know. They're not connected, are they? Yeah, they're connected. You see, why do we pray? Because prayer is a relationship. And if you can't fix relationships with people around you, how do you think you're going to fix your relationship with an invisible God? That's why we pray. What's a religious prayer? Going back to our big theme, religious versus righteous. A religious prayer is a prayer that is all external. And look at the model that Jesus gives six times, three of which he says, yours, your name, your kingdom, your will. Three times, and then three times, give us, lead us, forgive us. But in reality, it's five that are about God. Who, who leads us? God does. Who forgives us? God forgives us. And then give me my daily bread. Only one-sixth of this prayer is about, is about me. It's about you. The rest of the prayer is about, is about God. So a prayer that is religious, a prayer that is you know, external, is a prayer that is all about me, my needs, my wants. But a righteous prayer is a prayer that's about God. It's a relationship with Him. And Jesus says, you want to have an effective prayer? Don't focus on the external. There's nothing wrong with you and I getting into groups and praying like we're going to do tomorrow night here at the church. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but, but religious folks only focus on that. Righteous folks focus on them and their relationship with Dad. It's about Him. It's not about you. It's about Him. There was an old country church out in the middle of nowhere. And by this country church, there was this big field, and they were doing a, a movie not far from this country church, away from the city. And there was a lot of famous people who were doing this movie. And, and there was a famous actor who was going to be doing a, a country movie in that area. And he was invited to the local church there of about 100 people out in the middle of the country. And he went to the church, and he stood out like a sore thumb. I mean, here's the actor, and then here's everybody else. And that morning, the, the preacher happened to be speaking on the Lord's Prayer. 
and he gives his talk. And then he looks at the actor, the main actor, and he says, hey, why don't you come up here and give the Lord's Prayer? And this guy, actor, big name, big name, everybody knows him. He comes up, and he just delivers the Lord's Prayer beautifully. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. And it's just, it's eloquent, and it's clear, and it's just, it's moving. And the actor gets done, and he goes back to his seat. Pastor comes back up, says a few words, and he looks at old Billy. Billy's sitting in the front row, right in the front row, and Billy is in his mid-70s. He's been at the church forever since he was a little kid. Everybody knows Billy. And the pastor says to Billy, Billy, why don't you come up? Why don't you close us with the Lord's Prayer? And old Billy, he you know, kind of swaggers up to the up to the pulpit there, and he, with the microphone in front of him, he bows his head, and he, <clears throat> our Father, mm. hallowed be thy name, God, your name. Thy kingdom come, God, we pray. Thy will, God, thy will, let it be done. And he goes through the prayer. And when he's done, there's not a dry eye in the sanctuary. People were moved and they could just feel the prayer and they were just brought to tears. And after the service, there was a guest who was visiting with his friend and they're leaving and they're in the car and they're driving back. And, and, and the guest who, it was his first Sunday, he looked to his friend and he said, I don't, I don't get it. I, I just don't understand. Did I miss something? The actor came up and was just eloquent and was just clear and he delivered that Lord's Prayer beautifully and yet there was, no, there was no response. And then this old guy gets up, gives the Lord's Prayer and people are just moved to tears. I don't, I don't get it. Did I miss something? And his friend said to him, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't get it. You see, the actor, the actor knew the words. He knew the words. But old Billy, he knew the Father. He knew the Father. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, we are so, so grateful for the opportunity to come into your house and worship you. And Lord, we are grateful that we have the opportunity to speak to you personally and intimately. And that is something that nobody will be able to take from us. Thank you, Lord, that we can speak to you, not as a distant God, but as a very personal and intimate Daddy. I pray, Lord, for those that don't know that, that don't feel that, that, that feel distant from you. I pray, Lord, that you would show them that you love them, and you would teach us and teach all of us to get into our, our quiet place, to get into our, our inner closet and direct our prayers to Dad. And Lord, number two, I pray if we have broken relationships around us that we would fix them. Give us the wisdom and the strength to fix our broken relationships as you has, as you has taught us. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for the privilege and honor it is to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a video for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome.